Coming up next is Twitch. This week in computer hardware, this week we talk about a $1,200 video card and the possibility of using notebooks as home theater PCs. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's Twitch this week in computer hardware, episode number 77, recorded July 8th, 2010. The Greek God of Video Cards. This episode of Twitch is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. This is episode 77. Uh, I am. We are once again going to walk through some interesting news in the world of technology. We're going to talk about some really expensive components. Uh, but first, let's introduce our other host, Patrick Norton, fresh hey, from uh, packing up all your boxes and getting ready for a move. You know, every time I, I move, I think next time I move, I'm going to throw away all of the spare computer parts <laughs> and the cable box and the tools and move to Amish country and raise wheat. Every time I move, <laughs> I keep saying somebody else is going to move all this stuff next time, but then that doesn't happen. So, you know, I haven't I haven't moved in five years, so it's amazing how many extra computer cables you can stash in five. I mean, I, OK, for next week's show, I will have a picture of the pile of cables that is going for electronics recycling. Nice. It's epic, dude. It's completely I, have, I do have a garbage bag full of SATA cables. Um, That's officially, I actually SATA got cables. rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> they need a 12-step program for geeks collecting cables. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I would agree. Uh, so we're actually going to talk about how to move your technology. Patrick's going to give us some, some, some tips and some ideas. Uh, I was hoping moving. somebody would have some for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you're in the chat room and you have ideas, like maybe how to force yourself to throw away garbage that you don't really need, uh, we, we, any 12-step any books like Patrick was saying would probably work out well. Uh, before we get into that, we do have a couple of interesting articles to talk about. One of which I think Patrick is pretty... Uh, I want to say he's been a proponent of this for a long time, I think. And that is the idea of using a notebook computer or a netbook as a home theater PC, as opposed to the idea of building a small form factor desktop or even using a standard ATX size desktop into, you know, like a, a larger home theater style, one that kind of looks like a, like a home theater component computer that way. And I thought we'd kind of go back and forth a little here a little bit and debate some of the pros and cons of what that kind of entails. So you are a proponent of the notebook solution to home theater PCs? The notebook solution. The uh, Pardon me while I kill the alarm on my iPhone. That's yeah, funny. actually, uh, it was really funny because uh, uh, within a few days of each other, PC Perspective and Engadget HD, uh, the HD arm of, of Engadget.com, uh, which is uh, some really good crew over there, like, what's your suggestion for a home theater notebook? Uh, Matt Smith over at PCPer.com did uh, home, de home theater desktops, buy, I say, why notebooks are the answer. <laughs> Um, and it's it's a really great discussion about the fact that, you know, in terms of SD, notebooks have always been a really nice idea. If you had a, an output that would work with, uh, you know, your standard definition television, like a, you know, compositor and S video output from your notebook, it's 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 really easy because it takes like no rendering power to, to put a DVD up on a television. Um, right. But what's interesting about notebooks versus home theater desktops or repurposing a desktop or stuffing a desktop in a micro ATX form factor and then throwing that into a slick little case that you paid too much for so it kind of blends in with the stereo equipment up by your uh, HETV. So notebooks are compact. They give you an extra screen so you can actually have like all of your browsing, you know, setting up playlists and stuff for the party. Um, they're easy to use, do a remote control. If you're lucky, they're easy to do a remote control with. That can be a little problematic depending on the location of the USB ports. Um, but they're mostly they get really good performance for low power dot 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 if they have enough graphics and right. you know you know you know things get a little iffy like if you're thinking about hulu for example because uh hulu is an especially uh difficult uh form of flash video consumption um in terms of uh cranking clock cycles but hopefully uh now that uh 
uh, Adobe is finally getting up to speed with GPU acceleration for Flash, you won't have to worry about giant humming noises coming from your notebook or your desktop over by the HDTV anymore. Uh, something I've been a little bitter about in the past. Uh, <laughs> but I think one of the things about notebooks, though, is is there's they're small, they're self-contained, they blend. You can slide it in vertically. They slide right yeah. into the bookshelves. Um, you can put your little IR receiver on the top of it or an RF receiver on the top of it if you're lucky enough. Um, they're going to run Windows 7, but mostly though they're really low power, which is really great for a home theater PC because there's nothing worse than realizing you've you know added another seven bucks a month. Okay, I don't really worry about the power consumption as much as I probably should because the truth yeah, is, is most PCs, you know what I mean? When you're looking at an annualized cost of like $12 a year, um, you realize that shutting off your air conditioner an extra two nights a year is probably going to save more energy and, and more trees. But um, I actually like notebooks. Uh, for home theater PCs, um, especially since uh, Blu-ray drives have gotten a lot cheaper and more accessible. So that's kind of a rambling introduction. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's it, it, I, some of the things. So, I mean, when we're talking about using a notebook for an HTPC, what, what are those kind of features that you need to see? You already mentioned uh, GPU accelerated flash. Now that flash 10.1 is not a beta anymore, if you go just to standard uh, practices of installation of that plugin, you're going to get the GPU accelerated version that will work on NVIDIA uh, GPUs, AMD GPUs, ATI GPUs. It doesn't accelerate on Intel GPUs or Intel integrated graphics or anything like that, which is one of the issues with... Um, for example, this notebook that I have sitting here in front of me is a Lenovo X200. It has only Intel integrated graphics, so we wouldn't have any kind of uh, GPU hardware accelerated video. So Hulu HD would probably run a little bit sluggish on this. Now this happens to have a Core 2 Duo CPU in it, so it's fairly competent at doing that anyway. What you really get into the issue is if you are looking for like a really cheap notebook, something in the $500 range or so, maybe a little bit under that, uh, like a netbook type of thing. If you have an Atom mm -hmm. processor, you really need to make sure you have a discrete GPU on there. Either that be an Ion chip from NVIDIA or uh, even one of the Crystal HD chips that are starting to be bundled with the Atom parts as well. Because oh, you know, there's nothing actually, worse than... Go ahead. Oh, since so I actually just bought one of the uh, Broadcom Crystal HD PCI Express oh. cards because um, I'm experiment. I have I have a couple of Dell Mini netbooks, and I'm actually trying to turn one into the ultimate portable home theater box, like this little 10-inch okay. screen, this little three-pound box, um, because it's it's not too bad for H.264 video. It will not do. I will not do full screen 1080p currently, but I'm curious if you know if I can basically graft this PCI Express card inside of there. If I can get decent 1080p performance, I mean I should in theory have no problem getting decent uh, 1080p performance. Um, yeah, that's what's really funny is like for for the Intel graphics on the the, the i3, the i5, and the i7, you should have absolutely no difficulties with difficulties right. with uh, H.264 video, with uh, Blu-ray video, Blu-ray you know decoding with DVD decoding. Um, um, with QuickTime decoding, dot, dot, dot. However, when you get towards Flash, it can be troublesome. Netbooks are an entirely, netbooks that don't have any Atom-powered device, it doesn't have NVIDIA's Ion graphics, you're already in trouble uh, in terms right. of video performance. You're not going to get 1080p out of that. In theory, I might be able to get it with the Broadcom HD, so I'm kind of looking forward to experiment with that one. Um, but yeah, Flash, as always, seems to be, uh, you know, I want <laughs> Intel to catch up with Adobe. Adobe, of course, she's catching up with every other video encoding format on the planet or, you know, distribution right. format on the planet so that we have robust GPU-based acceleration for everything uh, so we don't have our fans ripping at Mach 7 while we're trying to watch a YouTube video. <laughs> yeah, if, if it can even do it at all, right? I mean, Atom processors and, 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 you, and Hulu HD don't really mix very well. Um, uh, you know, there, but there are some downsides. I mean, obviously, you always you would want an HDMI output uh, for this machine as well. You don't want to have to have because it, with HDMI, you've got your video and audio over one cable. It's great. Not only that, but if your source has high quality audio, then you should you know get 5.1, 7.1, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe uncompressed if you're really lucky and you have a system that's configured that way. But if you if you don't have HDMI, then you're looking at VGA or DVI which are probably okay for... Uh, DV, you know, DVI is not bad. It's just the... Then you get in the issue of carrying the audio over to your receiver. Right. How do you, um, yeah, how do you do that? It's, you know, or stereo output only type thing. If you could, you know, if you're... if 
the chances of finding a notebook, a low cost notebook that has optical output or some kind of digital audio output other than HDMI is going to be pretty <laughs> slim. So, yeah, but but that's what's amazed me is is when I bought these Dell Mini, I bought two Dell Minis, and both mm -hmm. of them have HDMI ports. This was a three hundred dollar notebook when I bought it a year ago with an HDMI output. And I was less like, yeah, <laughs> and then I was like, can't do ten eighty p, can barely do seven twenty p. Yeah, so that's why it's going to be like I said. That's why I picked up this Broadcom uh, Crystal HD to see if I can actually get the kind of performance out of this notebook that'll make it a useful uh, a useful HD playback device. Um, yeah, no, and the other issue is uh, if you if you're not running all of your content off of a central server or, or streaming it from another system, obviously mm -hmm. two and a half inch hard drives are more expensive um, right. than three and a half inch hard drives. So storage can be an issue. Blu-rays in notebooks are more expensive than Blu-ray hard drives for desktops. You know, don't sure. get me wrong; it's not without its caveats. But if you're looking for a low power system and you don't want to roll your own Atom Nvidia based box or or go for you know one of the entry level uh, mini IT X formats, then I think notebooks are definitely worth giving, especially if you're if you're doing the college thing, if you're doing like, you know, I am young and in the small apartment in the city. Um, if you're buying a new notebook, try to make sure it can behave or, or, or function as a, uh, a home theater system. That can be kind of a nice way to roll a whole bunch of things together. I don't know. I also like notebooks. <laughs> no, I, I think there are a lot of, I think there are a lot of positives to it. Like, yeah, the ability to just Take it and go if, if you're, you know, if, if it's something where, you know, multiple people are going to use the home theater PC and notebook uh, portability may not make a whole, might not make a whole lot of sense if you take it with you, if your wife or husband or whatever is going to be angry because you took the home theater PC and now they can't stream whatever they were planning on doing. Uh, that would obviously be a problem. And then as far as building a, a desktop goes, you know, you're going to have less concerns about performance issues, right? Because chances are you're going to use some kind of semi-modern, at least dual-core processor, maybe dual-core hyper-threaded. You're going to have a discrete GPU, or even if you have a motherboard with integrated graphics, if you have anything that's, you know, again, semi-modern, it's going to be more than powerful enough to run any of the video stuff. Um, hard drives, like you mentioned, two and a half hard, two and a half inch hard drives, they have high capacities. I think we're up to one terabyte, maybe even beyond one terabyte, two and a half inch drives now, but they're significantly yeah. more expensive. I mean, you can get a three and a half inch, two terabyte hard drive for like $109 or something like that. Now it's almost at a hundred dollars, might be below that in, in a couple of cases with rebates and stuff. So like if you, if you want to use a home theater PC as a DVR, not just a streaming media kind of server, then desktop, you know, you have some more considerations to go in there. If you want to be able to store everything, you know, if you're one of those guys that just wants to store everything, uh, every, every video, every, every TV show, every movie that's on, you want to be able to record, then a desktop component, again, is going to make a little bit more sense. Also, if you are thinking maybe to do, you, maybe you'll do some moderate gaming over the home theater PC. You know, if you want to play, if you're okay playing you know, Team Fortress 2 at 720p or something like that, Ten, even 1080p. 1080p is a fairly uh, easily handled resolution by most, you know, $100, $150 graphics cards these days. That's something you'll be able to get out of a desktop system that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get out of a notebook system. Um, so it's some, something else to consider as well, because that's one of the things always, it's always been for me, I've never actually done it, which tells you a little bit about some of the ease of some and simplicity of getting all these things working and getting all the software to work with the hardware correctly and that kind of stuff was was to get a home theater PC so I could play games on it and then you could use Hulu and then you could use you know Netflix or then you can watch you know the the Twit Live channel and all that kind of stuff on the TV without any issue and and what I found myself doing is is more leaning towards things like the Boxy Box or uh, the Roku Box or something like that but then those are very niche items that won't do a lot of other stuff. And so I, I like the idea of, of a notebook or a desktop, something with an operating system, something that, you know, if Netflix has a big update or maybe Amazon uh, streaming video services somehow takes off really big, you don't have to wait for this third party to kind of implement that application into your machine. You've, you've, got, a, you've got Windows 7 or you've got even, you know, Mac OS <laughs> and you, you, can, you can use all those things right away. Not as easy to control necessarily. I don't know how well or what your experience has been using remote controls with Windows 7s and or with Windows 7 and Media Center PCs and that kind of stuff. Excellent. It's never it's never good. I 
What? What have you it's, been it's, running? It's just, Windows it's just Media never Center good. and the the Windows Windows. You, you're not a Windows Media Center fan, then. I you're, no, you're an I, I do, I do kind of. Guy, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I like, I like. Uh, for instance, the the coolest thing I saw at CES, which this is my, it might be sad to see, is on the back of the boxy box remote control was a QWERTY keypad with a search You're button. You're talking about a product that hasn't shipped and will right, not ship. Right, but I saw the remote November. and I loved it. Uh, yeah, everybody loves that remote. <laughs> Lots of people are going to buy it, but you know what? You know, the, check out. You know, uh, Lenovo has a great integrated keyboard and and thumb drive. We talked about it on Texas mm. thumb drive trackball. We talked about it on Texilla. There's a oh, ton right, of right. Good wireless keyboards. Microsoft has had a couple of good mobile wireless keyboards. Windows Media Center with a proper Windows Media Center remote is actually really really good. I personally think it's the best way if you've got cable. Get a cable card and basically start using a home theater PC with Windows Media Center because you're, you're going to be so much happier than most of the set-top box DVRs that the cable companies are pushing these days. Yeah. Also, nope. before I forget, you you mentioned uh, drive capacities. Seagate mm -hmm. uh, basically finally dropped the three terabyte free agent GoFlex, uh, which oddly enough, uh, I want to say the uh, – oh, I can't think of which uh, site was reporting about it, but they – cracked one open and they basically said there was a single three and a half inch three terabyte drive inside of this the uh, goflex wow. uh just internal drives so it's it's the one where basically the plastic casing snaps off of a base so it can do us 2.0 mm -hmm. come mm -hmm. with it usb 3.0 or uh oh, okay. or firewire 800 but uh three That's terabyte interesting because we haven't seen any like bare drive three terabyte Everybody Releases expected, like I was certainly expecting uh, Western Digital to come out with them, you know, closer to, you know, November, you know, Black Friday kind of shopping yeah. time. And here's Seagate sneaking out with a three terabyte drive. Um, whether or not I can actually find one to buy is an entirely different question. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And how much is it going like to cost you as well? Uh, about 250 bucks. Um, okay. So, now think, I mean, totally off topic tangent, two terabytes, mm -hmm. 110 drive or $110. Three terabytes, two hundred fifty dollars. Well, so to put it in the, it's one of those things you're always paying for that extra. Yeah, the the GoFlex though is, is kind of a premium. Like it's you know a two terabyte GoFlex drive, external drive from Seagate. It's like one hundred ninety bucks. So uh, okay. okay, they're a little pricey for those. But I want to say it's going to be about two seventy five on the street. Two fifty actually. Uh, Two fifty for the basic drive from uh, from Seagate. But yeah, I can't wait for three terabyte drives. Um, because you know, I, I always want more storage. <laughs> another interesting kind of development we saw in terms of using laptops for home theater PCs, and we've been talking about this topic, is Intel Wi-Di. Now, the first, the first, this first generation of wireless display technology is kind of limited. Um, so if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a technology that has, basically has a separate wireless network in the laptop that's built to communicate with a specific set-top box or a little, little box that sits under your TV and plugs into your TV through an HDMI cable. And it mm -hmm. will wirelessly send the video display from your laptop to uh, that set-top box that then feeds it to the TV. So you can have your laptop on your lap or on the coffee table in front of you and you know, use the keyboard and mouse on that, use the trackpad, uh, you know, do whatever you need to do, and the video will be output through to the through the display or through your TV. The limitations of it are you can't do copy protected content right now. Like this first generation of it doesn't support uh, HDCP, so <laughs> you're really that limited it, to yeah, limited to YouTube don't... clips, that kind of stuff. So it's 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 a you're good idea. To... It will be there. I you know I keep thinking that I've, I've this is probably my third or fourth competing wireless display technology over the last five years. I'm I'm not holding my breath um, <laughs> when you're in demos with vendors and somebody walks between the base station and the television. You know what I mean? It's like as much as I want to hate on HDMI cables, and believe me, I do. And the HD base T alliance kind of is that the is that the right one? The HD base T alliance. Have you heard about this? The Ethernet. Substitute? Yeah, that's that's the Ethernet for everything. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, HD Base T. So I am sorry. I was wanting to make sure I had the name right. HD Base T Alliance, which is like LG, Sony, Samsung, and the uh, silicon manufacturer that came up with it. That's like HDMI, um, full full HD video, um, plus networking, plus control signal, all over an Ethernet cable, single Ethernet cable. Um, you know, I, every time I think somebody's going to come up with a way to do wireless display. You know, I end up realizing that for the most part, unless you're a business traveler that hates plugging a cable into their projector, it just never works out <laughs> as, right. as, as cleanly yeah. and simply as just plugging a cable from box A into this box This is true. You know this, I mean? iter I, this iteration has a lot of problems. I, I, I will be first to, to jump on that bandwagon because the HTCP issues, There's there's uh, you can't see the mouse cursor. On the uh, on the external the wireless screen because there's a lot of lag. That's a fail. <laughs> in it. So you can't really use it for like computing or gaming or anything, but you can start a video and then sit back and watch it. Right. That's kind of that's kind of the point of it. But they say the future generations they will have built in HDCP TVs will have this technology built in, so you don't have to have an external box for it. Um, I'm, so you yeah, know, with, I mean, there, there's a lot of reservations, but if they can get it to work, and this has this has Intel's weight behind it, which means a little bit more just like than YMAX. just your average home electronics company. For WiMAX, Intel. Say it again. WiMAX, Intel just like shuttered their hey, entire. Hey, I've got I've got my version. WiMAX phone right here. See, it's a 4G. Some, yes, some fruit of that labor. It's a labor. sprint clear wire, but Intel <laughs> hasn't Intel fundamentally walked away from WiMAX. I'm just saying, like yeah, Intel yeah. put their, you know, Intel puts their weight behind a lot of things, but you know, sure. the only thing Intel puts their weight behind consistently, utterly, and totally at this stage is 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 you know CPUs and chipsets and motherboards. Everything else, I think, is is a work in progress um, <laughs> in service to selling more chips and CPUs and motherboards, True. mostly CPUs. I know, you know, I mean, I don't want to be down on, on wireless oh, display technology. I, 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 I dream of one day of sitting down with my wireless <laughs> keyboard that doesn't run out of batteries every 20 minutes and which is connected to a <laughs> beautiful sculpted box, which is wirelessly connected to my floating. Cause at this point, cause I figure by the time we've got wireless, video working really well we'll have anti-gravity technology so we don't need monitor stands anymore um and probably by that point we'll just <laughs> jack and stuff into our neck connection yeah but you know yeah, what I mean? like definitely you know i don't know we should probably we'll say thank you to audible <laughs> yes let's do uh we would do want to thank the uh, sponsor for today's episode, as Patrick pointed out, audible.com. Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks with more than 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For listeners of Twitch, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out their service. Uh, one audiobook you might consider trying is an old one. This was, I was trying to find something that I hadn't already selected, and I think I might have failed already at this. But uh, if, if, Patrick, I don't know how big of a Star Wars fan you are. I assume if you're a geek, you have to be at least somewhat a Star Wars fan, right? I am a huge uh, 4, 5, and 6 fan if I never see episode sure. 1 again. I've actually <laughs> never read one of the Star Wars books. Okay, well, of if you have the, not. I've read thousands of science fiction books, but I have yet to actually read one of the Star Wars sci-fi books. The Probably, I think... Uh, for us, really hardcore Star Wars nerds, uh, and I've Real read Star think, Wars nerds, not like me. <laughs> I've, I've, I've read every novel that has come out. Um, so th I think this one that I'm recommending, Star Wars: uh, the Th the Thrawn trilogy, is probably the best place to start. So these books uh, take place after Episode Six, after Return of the Jedi, and there are several before between the end of that movie and what happens in this story. But in terms of a good overall story, it involves all the original characters, uh, and and a lot of interesting things happen. This Heir to the Empire is the name of this one. It's part one of a of a trilogy. It's available on Audible. Uh, it's a short listen, so it, you know it's not one of those. 15 hour reads if you if you tend to get weighed down by a lot of things like that it's i think it's just over three hours or so it's an abridged version of it uh but it's definitely worth trying if if you've if you've never gone into what they call the expanded universe of star wars uh and you've got a few hours to kill you know in either in transportation or exercise or whatever you're doing anywhere where you can't read you can listen to these audiobooks and i think this is a good one to try out i think 
th- that was the first one I actually read. It was one. Of, it was a big deal. It was like the first Star Wars book to make the New York Times number one spot or whatever it was. And so I was like, okay, I'll try it. And then I got hooked on them and have read. You know, now I'm to the point where every five months or something, a new one comes out. I have downloaded it, listened to it in the span of four days. I'm like, okay, now I'm ready for the next one, that type of thing. So nice. uh, if you want to try out your free uh, Audible book, all you have to do is go to audiblepodcast.com slash Twitch. That's T-W-I-C-H. Uh, and we thank Audible for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Woo-hoo. Now, speaking of uh, really cool things, now Audible, podca- Audible gave you a book for free. This graphics card is not free. <laughs> this video card that I'm holding up is the Asus Ares. And uh, Ares is uh, a Greek or Roman god. I'm going to get in trouble for that because I don't remember exact. I don't remember which one it was. I want to say it's a Greek god of war or it's the Roman, one of those two. But what you're looking at is like the ultimate graphics card if you have an unlimited budget. This is a $1,200 video card, Patrick. Um which is more than probably most people's PCs in total, including their monitors, even if they have like a fairly high-end gaming computer, chances are you will pay less for that system than for this video card. Uh, that, what makes- that monitor, or excuse me, that graphic, that GPU minus my SSD is pretty much what my last, uh, and my, probably my first full-on, I'm going to spend real adult money on a gaming PC cost <laughs> less than yeah. that card. Ares, by the way, is the Greek... Uh, uh, okay. Son of Zeus and Hera. Uh, so, so I had that right. Okay, at least the first because, time I did. Uh, what but, what what makes this card special is graphics card. But we have seen those before. You might know the AMD Radeon HD fifty nine seventy already exists, and that is a pair of uh, what are they? Cypress GPUs. So the sixteen hundred stream processor parts, but they're clocked at about seven hundred seven hundred twenty five megahertz. This card takes the same GPUs, but clocks them at 850 megahertz. So this is really a pair of true Radeon HD 5870 parts. Um, and so obviously, as you can imagine, that 125 megahertz clock speed difference is going to make a pretty big difference in your overall performance. Um, flip, flip it over. Flip it over so people yeah. can see the the I guess I, I, the the power consumption and the gigantic size of the uh, the cooling system so on this. The, kind that's of blew the back me away. of the card. Yeah, that's the back of the card. Uh, you can see up here at the top these little uh, uh, connectors here, not connectors, but uh, points. Those dip let switches? You, oh, okay. <laughs> no, they'll let you test the voltages to the, each of the GPUs. If you're an extreme overclocker and you've got liquid nitrogen going to these things, you, know, you can check the voltage that way. And then if we look at the power connections on it, you will see that there are two 8-pin PCI Express power connectors and one 6-pin so, yeah, somebody pointed out, or Alan pointed out to me last night that that's actually more, if you have all three of those connected, you have more ATX 12-volt lines connected to the graphics card than you do to the motherboard itself. So, <laughs> more than that to the motherboard and the processor. And, you know, don't forget, over this PCI Express bus, you get 75 watts of power to the GPU. And then uh, each six pin is worth... 75 more watts than each of these is up to 125 or 150 watts. So, so um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 watts. <laughs> uh, that's that's peak. So what what actually Asus tells me is that the the two eight pins are all that are all that is required. The six pin is kind of an auxiliary that you don't have to use, but if you're going to overclock the card faster than it already is, uh, power consumption will get pretty high fairly quickly. This is what know, everybody's so been it's... waiting to buy 1,200 watt power supplies for. This is the actual card that can use a 1,200 power 1,200 it's, it's watt actually, power supply. It was surprisingly not that bad. So, uh, if you go to PC Perspective, PCPer.com, there's a review of this card up there, and our power consumption numbers with this card. Now, keep in mind we're talking about the whole system, which is a quad core Intel i7 part, uh, one hard drive, and then this graphics card and motherboard essentially was just over 500 watts, hmm. maybe 550. Um, and that's not too bad uh, considering, you know, how many power connectors it has, how heavy this card is. It's really, really heavy copper heat sinks on here. Um, but 550 watts is, it was between 5 and 550, but that's maybe 60 watts more than a single GPU GeForce GTX 480, which... 
tells us a little bit about the power efficiency of both of those GPUs individually, right? You can get two really mm -hmm. powerful ones, um, and then one of NVIDIA's really powerful ones is using a lot more power. It's faster, but it's not as much faster as it is consuming more power, if that sentence made any sense. No, I think um, it did. <laughs> It's good, a good, reasonable good. power boost over, you know, it's a, it's a reason the power consumption is, is a little more reasonable than two separate cards, it sounds like. Correct. Okay. Um, they're only going to make a thousand of these. So they're labeling it as a limited edition card. There's only going to be uh, a thousand of them made. So if you get your hands on one, it's kind of a, a notoriety item as well as a super ultra performance single graphics card. It does obviously in our testing become the fastest single graphics card we've ever tested. Not the, singest, not the fastest gaming <laughs> configuration, because if you have a pair of GTX 480s, it's going to be this faster than this single card. But in terms of one card, one PCI Express slot filled, uh, one monitor connection, you know, that's, this, this is the ultimate card for that, as you would expect, again, for $1,200. <laughs> um, uh, a couple of disappointing things other than the price, obviously. The, the connections here actually... Um, are, are were a little bit of a letdown for me because what we're looking at here is you see there's a dual link DVI port, the white one, and then in the middle is a display port, and at the other side is an HDMI connection. And that's not too <laughs> bad, right? I mean, you've got, uh, you know, the dual link DVI can support 30 inch monitor. The display port connection can support up to a 30 inch monitor as well, depending on if you have uh, either a display port monitor or an active display port adapter. The HDMI port, however, only supports a 19 by 12 or 1080p panel. This HDMI is connection, it only has that much bandwidth. That's all it's, it's rated to support. So you can't run three 30 inch panels on this card. I know not a lot of people are doing that, but not a lot of people are gonna buy this graphics card either. Well, you can so, run two 30 inch panels in a 1080, 30 inch 1080p television. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Why, why, were, what's, why, wouldn't they, why didn't they do dual DVI or, or dual display ports? That just doesn't make sense to me on a car. You know what I mean? So you're you, gonna... Yeah, no, I agree. What, what, what they did was, was they, my, when I asked them this question, they said their feedback from customers said that they valued an HDMI port on the graphics card more than the ability to do three 30-inch displays. So that, that's what they are seeing there. Apparently, their customers wanted. So you can still do iFinity. You can still do three display gaming, but it has to be three, you know, 19 by 12 panels. You can't do three 30-inch panels. You can still do one 30-inch panel gaming, which, you know, this card is going to have more than enough power to push basically any game at, at, at that right. point with all the top image quality settings. But I agree, I agree with you. It's like, you know, you can, you can have a DVI to HDMI adapter. So now why not have two DVI ports and then a display port, um, right. which, which is what all 5870s today have. So was there know, an engineering issue related to that? Or, or, I mean, it's not like they were doing it for well, price considerations, kind of, were they? If they'd had two DVI ports on this, they would have had to move the display port up to this part right here, and then they would have cut down on the amount of cooling space that would be able to exhaust from the back of the card, essentially. This, this, so it's a two-slot card, and there's one slot dedicated to cooling here. Mm -hmm. um, here, let me change this angle again. And if they put two DVI ports in there, they would have had to remove part of that exhaust vent area because they wouldn't be able to afford, they, they couldn't fit two DVIs and a display port in a single line. They could have done two DVIs and mini display port. I mean, there, there are ways they could have gotten around it, I think. So they, they definitely just kind of made this decision that people like integrated HDMI ports. So that, that's kind of like the one thing that I would have changed if I was going to make a $1,200 graphics card. Um, but, you know, in terms of engineering, they did, I mean, this is a custom design card. This is not an ATI reference design that ASUS is rebranding. They did all this kind of engineering work in-house. Um, they really, The coolers on this are capable of cooling very, very well. The, the large fan on here is actually quieter at stock speeds than the reference cooler, but it can push 120 CFM if you want it to. And in wow. that case, it's not quiet at all. It's very, very <laughs> <No>. low. <laughs> Um, but what it does allow you to do is overclock the GPUs even further. They come at 850 megahertz. I overclocked them to 950 megahertz with basically no work at all. And, um, you know, the, the fan got louder if you leave it on the temperature controlled settings and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but they're pushing up almost a gigahertz speed. So 
you know, we went from 725 to 850 from the dual GPU card that already exists to this one. And then you can go up to, you know, maybe 950 or a, a gigahertz and get another 100 to 150 megahertz out of it. You know, we're talking anywhere from 20 to 40 percent speed difference between the 5970 and this. Now, there's more. There's a 2x price difference, but uh, you know, you're talking about 50, maybe maybe up to 50 percent performance gap as well. So, uh, if anybody's listening to this, has a lot of money and they <laughs> want to buy a really expensive graphics card next week, these are going to be on sale. Limited, like I said, limited edition to a thousand. I, I I imagine they'll probably put 700 in the channel, maybe sell okay. two to 250 to the add-in systems and that kind of thing. So, um, uh, not on go. my list, man. It looks yeah. lovely. Mm -hmm. Looks heavy, and dude. <laughs> it is heavy. It's like, it's like six pounds, five and a half, six pounds, which is, it's not a lot, obviously, but considering, you know, some of the other graphics cards we're testing are, I mean, it's like picking up a normal card now. It's just like, whoa, you almost kind of like throw it up in the air when you, when I was picking them up because mm -hmm. this thing, like we actually, in our open test bed, um, I set something underneath the back end of it because I was worried about uh, the weight of it, like tilting the motherboard up because we don't have it screwed down to anything necessarily. It's, it's all open air and sitting on a box and stuff. So keep that in mind. I would imagine shipping this in a system would be kind of a pain. Be very, very worried about it coming out of its PCI Express slot, at least a little. Back to, remember when they used to heat glue, like get the heat glue, the hot glue guns and hot glue uh, boards into place on PCI slots? Yep. That's old school, yeah. man. <laughs> they still do that with like SATA cables and power cables and stuff. Every once in a while, we get systems in that do that. So, uh, speaking of Infinity, I will mention real quick uh, last week's show, we talked about. NVIDIA Surround versus ATI Infinity and the price differences on um, having to buy an active adapter for the mm -hmm. ATI system, which would add about $100 to it. I got several emails about one of these types of little devices. And this is, this is a display port. Uh, don't focus on the video card. This is a display port connection to VGA port. So this actually works. So you can... The kind of the, the caveat here with, with the ATI cards was you can only have two DVI and then you had to have a display port. Hmm. This will let you use a display port to a VGA. If your monitor has VGA output, I mean, VGA is not the best quality. You run into, you're talking about an analog signal again and that kind of stuff. So this will get the job done. I think I picked this one up at Newegg after people recommended it to me for about 25 bucks, 20 to 25 dollars. So not, not free, but still noticeably cheaper than a hundred dollars. And mm -hmm. if you uh, are, have three displays and they have DVI, DVI, and VGA connections, then you'll be able to run three of them at one time uh, using this little, this little doohickey. So that would, in theory, if you're willing to use VGA rather than a digital connection, take about $75 off this price as we talked about last week. But I just figured I'd, I wanted to bring that up since we had several people that emailed me after the show and said, hey, by the way, there's at least a couple of these out there. And I made sure I checked and they were certified by AMD for the Ifinity stuff as well. So Nice. All right. Uh, there was... No, you so let's, let's jump right into talking about the intricacies of moving technology. No, 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 no. Because you got me... I've, I've been like seeing Project Offset on the list. Oh, okay. And I've been you want like, to talk about that? Okay. What's Project Offset? I've been I've been looking I've been eyeballing that in the list like all during the show and kind of like what so is projects. This? If you click through this link, they have some uh, they'll have some other links that will uh, it goes to a site called BigDownload.com, which is a kind of a gaming news site, a PC gaming news site, and there was a company called Offset Software that years and years ago was making a gaming engine. It was mm -hmm. awesome looking. Uh, when I would go to NVIDIA Editor's Days, I think it was NVIDIA, it might have been both NVIDIA and AMD, they would have these, you know, to show off the newest graphics card that was coming out, you know, the 8000 series or whatever it was at that time, they would have these, these they'd always bring in these software developers to show off demos. And Offset Software and Project Offset was this game engine that was really, really, really impressive looking. They had demos with elves that were throwing axes or, or, or dwarves were throwing axes and elves shooting arrows and this kind of stuff. And it was like Unreal Engine 3 quality or better at the time rendering uh, of game characters. And, you know, we, we saw these for a couple of years and it was kind of like, 
a running joke amongst the, the you know the hardware press that this was a game that was never going to see the light of day because we'd only ever seen it in these kind of tech demos and things. But they were making an engine to sell to game developers that then they would be able to use for whatever games they want to do. Well, when Intel started getting into the Larrabee project, the mm -hmm. or Larrabee products where they were going to come into the world of discrete graphics, they ended up buying Offset Software and the project Offset Project Offset as well. With they never really came out and said exactly what they planned on doing, but it was obvious what they wanted to do was port this game engine over to Intel's hardware, demonstrate that you can do really really awesome graphics on a gaming platform using Intel's discrete GPUs. Maybe they were going to convert it to using a ray tracing engine instead of rasterizing engine, or maybe they were just going to really optimize the engine so that they would rasterize well on Larrabee's architecture. We never really knew for sure, but that was the only reason really for them to buy uh, this company. And we, and as soon as they bought it, we kind of thought, well, they're probably never going to really make a game now, but we'll at least get to see some more demos. Maybe they'll do some more cool stuff with the Intel. Well, Larrabee got canceled. Long story short, Larrabee got canceled. Uh, it's been pushed back. Intel has basically said they're not really going to get into the discrete graphics market anymore. They, they realize it's either more difficult than they thought or that the other product lines are converging at a different rate. Right. And with that, we kind of had lost track of what Project Offset uh, was. Well, apparently, the team at Intel that was responsible for that has now been uh, or has moved on to other projects outside the company which I think is a nice way of saying have either been fired, laid off, or quit. <laughs> um, and they started up a new company. Apparently, a lot of the founders of Offset Software have started a new company called Fractive LLC uh, uh, as a new de game development studio. So I don't know if we'll be able to see something like this technology pop up again. But right. it was... It was interesting, just from a hardware perspective, it was always something we were talking about. We would always show these screenshots and look how awesome these games are going to look. And then Intel bought them and we were kind of worried that we would never see the game and we thought, well, we hadn't really seen any game to begin with. Right. Now we know that we're definitely not going to see something and it was kind of, it's kind of disappointing. I don't know if, if, uh, if we see, if we can find screenshots of, of what this software and what their characters were supposed to do. It was, I mean, it was, it was some really impressive stuff. Uh, that's, I don't know, that one of those things PC gamers really were looking forward to. I mean, the Project Offsite, Offset website is still up, apparently. I just kind of clicked through to it, actually. Um, so you could apparently go there and see some screenshots and stuff. I mean, there's, there's a good chance that now that they're, they're outside of Intel, maybe they're more likely to actually have a product release and, and you know, or maybe do short demos or to sell the technology to, to gaming vendors where maybe inside of Intel they were being sort of reserved yeah. for whatever program they were working on. So yeah. I don't know. Hopefully we'll get to see something out of that because uh, I know you were pretty enthusiastic about it. So I wanted to make sure we got a chance to talk about it. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Now let's talk about something just as exciting, uh, moving. And packing boxes. <laughs> now, yeah. this is something I haven't done in five years, actually. I moved into my house five years ago. And I didn't have near as much, we'll call it uh, stuff instead of junk. That way my wife doesn't hear and want me to throw away stuff that's called junk. <laughs> um, I had a lot less stuff than I do now. I would not even want to fathom the idea of having to pack all of this up to move to a different location at this point. But this is what you had to do. So I'm curious of uh, if you took my mentality, which would be take as big a box as possible and throw stuff in until it was too heavy uh, and then tape it <laughs> closed and give it to somebody else. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, uh, there were several attempts to get rid of what was affectionately known as the giant box of crap through Twit several years ago that never quite worked out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, almost actually five years ago now that I think about it. Um, actually, what's been interesting is, is, is how useful, you know, plastic bins from Home Depot. I found these industrial grade plastic bins um, that are much heavier duty than the last round. Because the last round of plastic bins I bought all disintegrated with light use. Um, you know, for me, it's actually been uh, culling all of the additional cables. We were joking actually before the show, you know, about the, you know, all geeks tend to have like the cable drawer. In my case, it's the cable stack of boxes. And I started sorting it out and I realized for some reason, um, despite the fact that I still have no 20 amp power supply cords, which are the ones with the flat connectors, I need them mm -hmm. for a, a couple of Dell systems I'm trying to to, uh, to rebuild. Um, <laughs> I think I literally have almost a cubic yard of power cords. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> yeah, the you know it's the the Ethernet, USB, all the other stuff. Uh, I do not unlike you. Apparently, you still have you know you said you have like a garbage bag full of SATA cables. My, when my, I first my heard that, biggest I you claim said to scuzzy. fame is that yeah. <laughs> It's like a, it it's, not, a, it's not it's not a it's not a twenty gallon. It's only a thirteen gallon bag, though, right? So it's like a kitchen. It's a tall kitchen bag full of static cables. <laughs> I don't know. What's been interesting for me is like obviously getting the label maker out, you know, dividing stuff up. What's been interesting is is we're kind of taking the network down and the ACTV last because, um, right. you know, we're doing a little guilty parenting, which is taking a, a advantage of my son's obsession with Pixar. He's starting to really get spooked by the move, right? Because he's he's two and a half. He's very tiny. He's well, he's kind of a burly little two year old. He looks like he's four, but um, you know, obviously everything's being packed up. You know, something's changing, and so you know, the HGTV. It's kind of like you know the the computers, the H, the, the computers, the home network, and the HGTV are all going last. Um, right. And what's been funny is is noticing like how much easier and how much uh, still of a pain it is to to you know get your you know the the electricity was easy to get up uh unfortunately i was going to transfer my current cable uh uh internet to the new location just to find out that the old tenants from the apartments haven't yet canceled their service so i have to go to the instead of being able mm. to do five minutes which actually sort of a promise it, it implied five minutes which turned out to two sets of the same form twice and then like 15 minutes of giving the same exact information a third time to an online assistant in the little chat form because it's right. all customer service and they were happy to have me as their first customer of the day. They typed that like three times <laughs> as I'm, I'm trying to find the, the, the account nice. number they asked for. Yeah, I'm sitting there like, this is really freaky. You seem really nice. Um, <laughs> and it's sort of like, have you been really lonely all day? Um, nice. But then like realizing that I am actually going to have to go to the local uh, – uh, office, yeah, I was I was kind of bumming because there's a really good uh, uh, DSL provider who is literally wiring the city that I'm moving to, but hasn't finished wiring yet. So it's like mm. maybe I could stretch an Ethernet cable from your colo location to my house. Maybe no, um, nice but try. you know. Yeah, well, it's kind of funny, like, you know, putting together the final checklist for everything, um, packing up all the extraneous, like, you know, everything we don't absolutely need. So the Roku box, the Apple TV, um, the, you know, the 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 extra gigabit, uh, you know, basically the gigabit switching that goes with the home theater stuff <laughs> is all packed up. So it's basically done to the wireless connection on the Apple TV, the Blu-ray player and the direct TV box. Um, and I also forgot how much I hate packing um up the network and preparing it to travel. Although I am, I am, uh, I am actually though pretty, pretty with you on the whole. I, I haven't actually just dumped everything into a box. Um, I actually am wrapping individual items in the box that they're going into. <laughs> yeah, I could see that at the beginning of the packing, uh, you know, that week. But probably by the end of the week, that's usually what happens. Is I, you know, like I'll maybe I'll have zip ties and I'll try to organize things that way and. And maybe I'll use rubber bands to keep power cords with that device so that they go in the same thing. But the, but at the end, I'm like, what do those cables go to? And I go, I don't know. And I just scoop them up and throw them in a box. And I go, oh, I'll deal with it later. And I think five years later, all those items are still sitting in a box, probably in our basement. So. That's pretty scary. Yeah, I'm hoping to make anything that anything I haven't touched in 12 months, uh, unless I have a really good reason for keeping it, I think is going away from the collection at this point. And you have um, more willpower than I, sir. I didn't say I was going to pull off. The lab actually is the the entire <laughs> household is being moved except for the lab of hope and coffee. Uh, that's the last part of the move. I get to do that myself. Uh, and it's being moved into a somewhat more limited area in the new home. So it should be uh, – should, I should have interesting things to say next week if I'm not like, you know, <laughs> kicking <laughs> – if I'm not calling you from like a, you know like, – uh, <laughs> A borrowed DSL connection in my buddy's office in the place we're moving to. Um, nice. Yeah, it, it amazes me actually. It's you know in a in a whole like you know, I used to have to walk up street both ways in the snow, not like you kids today. But it is actually I I, I thought I was actually going to be able to move everything and turn on all the, the power and everything else at the new uh, location online. Uh, but thankfully, huh. uh, Pacific Gas and Electric and Comcast have foiled my plans for a complete online transition to the new place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah actually, I would never even thought about that capability, actually. But that would, yeah, that would be interesting. At least things are easier that way. So, <laughs> Until you spend 
30, 45 minutes online to find out that you've got to take a copy of your lease to the office on, you know, in the place you're moving to, which means you've lost your uh, a possibility of having an appointment on the week mm-hmm. you've moved into your new place. Yeah, that's always fun. Well, when's, when's as soon as you can get out here? Uh, seven <sighs> to 10 days. I'm like, oh, what am I supposed to do for seven to 10 days? Fortunately, oh, well. I have a 3G slash 4G modem. So I'm hoping maybe there'll be a major act of Providence and, and Sprint will turn on 4G in the East Bay <laughs> <laughs> this week. You know, if anybody from Let Sprint you know happens to be listening, right around 11 on Sunday, if you just turn <laughs> on the 4G in the East Bay, my wife would be so stoked, especially with that unlimited data cap. <laughs> At least that one tower near where you're going to live, right? You know, I mean, maybe you know, I can make that happen. Alameda, if you can turn on the 4G in Alameda just for a couple days, I promise I won't abuse it. <laughs> nice, nice. Also, would be interesting All to see right. if I get my overdrive modem to melt down. Yeah, yeah. Leave it plugged into the wall, and then you'd probably have a better chance that way, too. All right, you want to jump into a – we've got we just got a handful of Twitter questions uh, here for today. I will uh, take this first one from UCR Dave, who asks, uh, Acer Slim Desktop – with PCI Express, what's the best low-profile video card for gaming that will fit? So mm-hmm. it's got a, a, a slim desktop, which means you can't use a full-size PCI Express graphics card. You have to get one of the low-end, smaller, cut-down versions. Would it be possible to do one of those cool guy 90-degree you know, benders for the PCI Express slot so that you could lay a full size card across. Is there enough room in the case to do that? Because I've actually done that in the past. Drop if sixty there dollars. Is, it probably doesn't have the case probably doesn't have a a bracket to be able to screw that card into place. <laughs> that makes sense. That's what silicon is for. <laughs> well yes, that's true. I mean you, you a little can, silicon in there to hold the card in place. <laughs> You've all, you okay. know, you've got to have some place for your data, for your video cable to come out and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I was looking cool. around Newegg, and uh, what is interesting is there's, there, there are honestly not a whole lot of options for that. So if I go to low profile ready here, well, actually, there are a lot, but there aren't a lot of medium to high end modern generation uh, graphics cards for that. So let me see. The last one I remember testing personally was a GeForce GT 240, I believe. Um, that was a while ago. <laughs> which is, well, it's, it's relatively modern, but it's not, it, it's relatively recently released, I'd say within the last year, but it's a low-end part. So, I mean, it's it's not going to be a very high-end part. I'm looking looking through now, and I see eight Radeon HD 4650s, uh, 9600 GTs, 90, I see a 9800 GT. That's probably going to be your, I see a 5550, um, 5570. So there are some on there. If you go to, if you go to some place like Newegg, you don't have to go to Newegg, but if you go to Newegg, go to the graphics card section, go to advanced search, there's a drop-down box that says form factor, and you can select low profile ready. And those are graphics cards that are going to have both a bracket to fit in a full-size case and a smaller bracket, and the card is formatted to fit into the larger size case. Or I'm sorry, the smaller size case. Um, then you need to just look at you know what your price ranges are. They they don't get really expensive because of uh, the generational gaps that there are. But say the 9800 GT is from Sparkle, 99 bucks shipped. Uh, and then you've got if you look at the HD 5570 from ASUS, that card's going to be 89 dollars. So these aren't super high end graphics cards in any by any stretch of the imagination anymore. But yeah. the modern cards don't have the capability to uh, be put on a sm- as small a PCB as was required for the half-height cards. Um, so my recommendation would probably either be the 5570 or the 9800 GT options there. <laughs> Under 100 bucks. So you've got, a, you know, you've got several options there at least um, with that. And it will be better than whatever you have integrated into your uh, Acer Slim desktop as well. So, uh, you want to let's let's get our next question here. I'll have you try to pronounce uh, that name. Andrew Gottpiat at Ryan Shroud. Is it worth the money to upgrade from AMD quad core to a six core for gaming? Do games even take advantage of all cores? Uh, my knee jerk response would be no. 
in two or three years from now, there'll be lots of video games that actually take advantage of quad core or possibly even six core uh, processors. But for the most part, games are pretty core. The, they basically most games are still looking for a single or a dual core CPU, or I should say, most game designers are engineering their games to to for optimal performance on at most a dual core system and. Um, you know, in the next couple of years, I think it's going to change. If you're looking for a faster gaming performance, uh, overclocking, a quad-core processor upgrade, uh, additional memory, a GPU. Actually, probably I'd say a GPU upgrade first. Going to, uh, f- you know, four gigabytes of memory if you aren't there already. If you want your games to load faster than a hard drive upgrade or an SS upgrade to an SSD might be nice. But yeah. six cores are not going to give you the extra frames per second that I suspect you're looking for. So sorry, no. Andrew. Yeah, not not uh, worth the investment. There, I mean, there are some games. Uh, Intel has been pushing uh, some software developers to get into it. The only one I know of that will take advantage of X threads, so as many cores as you have, is a, is mm-hmm. total is the latest Total War game. Um, hmm. But even then, you're not going to see as big of improvements moving from four to six right. as you would see upgrading your graphics card. So, totally. totally yeah. Fair What's your? I mean, what's your favorite? What's what, let's try to go like? What would be a? Uh, what would be the GPU of choice for the cost of a, a six-core AMD CPU? Let's see. So a six six-core AMD CPU is going to be about two hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. And if I were going to be, let's see, how can I say this? If I were going to spend two hundred dollars on a GPU today, I would wait until next week. <laughs> That is does a that, hot tip, people. Does that does that make does that make sense? Yeah. If you were considering spending two hundred dollars on an AMD Phenom two X six or its equivalent GPU in price, please wait a week. You'll be happy yeah. you did. <laughs> Come back to Twitch next Thursday, and uh, we will talk about something involving those prices and the word graphics cards. Not not a, not a doubt. Uh. Considering I'm actually shopping around for a graphics card because some friends of mine are convincing me to get my Steam on in the near future, I yep. will be here next week just so I can find out what Good. the bar well, is. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Uh, Web Daddy at Ryan Trout request not a question please no mention of i4 f- iPhone 4 antenna issues I think we need to flash a picture has anybody flashed a picture of the iPhone 5 yet No no I haven't seen the iPhone 5 uh, I, I must have missed out on that news is it is a, it duct a, tape iPhone 4 Somebody basically uh, you know pretend glued a big uh, rubber ducky style <laughs> antenna on top of an iPhone 4 and and people are, depending on which email thread is going around it's either the iPhone 4 antenna problem solved or the iPhone 5 design uh, but web daddy nice. you've asked for us not to discuss the dreaded 4 <laughs> something that shall not be named like Voldemort. So we'll just skip on to PC technologist. What is a good upgrade from an i7-920 Asus P6T? Get a newer i7 or an AMD hex core or a new video card. I've got a 4890 now. If you're a video gamer, I'm thinking the sore one on that list is probably the 4890. Yeah. Uh, uh, eh, I, it's, my first instance was to tell uh, this gentleman that he probably doesn't need to upgrade Jack <laughs> on his system. Get an SOD? Uh, yeah. I mean, if you've got, uh, I mean, so of those parts that he listed, you're right. The HD 4890 is probably the one that you might get uh, more performance boost from. You'd have, right. but the thing is, you'd have to move from that card to like a 5850 or a 5870. Right. 5870 is going to run you about $379. Um, if you're asking to upgrade those components, that's probably not out of the question. I mean, hey, maybe, hey, you could get an Asus Ares card. There will, there will be <laughs> only a thousand of them made and they're $1,200. That will definitely be an upgrade for your system. Um, but yeah, Pardon? look at an SSD or if you have, if you only have two gigs of memory, move to four or eight, you know, yeah. you could see advantages in that. Maybe not in gaming necessarily. You'd see a little bit in gaming, but it's just general all-purpose computing and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the Core i7-920, if you're not overclocking it, overclock. Part, part of it's like, you know, to PC technologists and anybody else out there, when you're asking a performance improvement question about your system, definitely tell us what you're doing on it. Are you a video right. gamer? 
Are you rendering video? Do you use a particular, does one particular application rule your life? Because there's certain applications, you know, certain applications like I use 3D rendering programs or I use video rendering programs. And if they'll take advantage of, of as many cores as you throw at them, suddenly going from a dual core to a quad core or a six core system, or maybe going from a quad core to a six core system starts looking really attractive. If you're a video gamer, it becomes less about having eight gigabytes of RAM and, you know, uh, you know, six cores. And it suddenly is about getting the most performance out of, say, your first two cores and maximizing your GPU. Um, you know, if you're a big multitasker, general purpose computer user, uh, but you still use some heavy apps like Photoshop or, or some video editing applications, maybe eight to 12 gigabytes of RAM is looking really attractive, which is really cool when you're running an SSD. And first of all, if you're kind of a luxury computer user, if you're looking for a high end upgrade uh, and the, the price is coming down and I think it's really going to become more affordable by the end of this year. And SSD is amazing for boot up times. It's amazing as a scratch drive. It's amazing. You know, if you're video editing, um, it's amazing. Like, you know, when you're opening up huge files or huge projects, it's really nice to see the performance improvement from an SSD drive. Like my, you know, I'm not going to be storing, you know, 900 CDs worth of lossless data on yep. SSD drives, not for the next <laughs> couple of years, right? But you know, it'd be kind of, you know, ooh, I can stream my, you know, 500 kbps or, you know, whatever it is, the the uh, bit rate on the audio file that I've I've been you know, taking for granted for so long, I've, I can't even remember it. But yeah. an SSD drive is is ridiculously uh, the, the the boot up time and and the application launch time. And for some applications, uh, you know, in terms of the scratch file performance or, or file yep. opening performance is really nice. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty good system. You know, um, you know, the going from an i seven nine twenty to the top, the current top of the line Intel processor is not going to be a blow your hair back kind of experience. You're going to want to need probably wait almost another generation on the processor to get that sort of like, wow, what an amazing performance improvement, which is always really frustrating, right? You know, you you know, you spend three four hundred dollars for a new processor, you pretty much have to wait until that processor you bought is worth about fifty bucks to buy the new four hundred dollar processor. Right. You know, a, a big like you know, 30, 50, 80% performance boost, um, 80% being tongue in cheek. Cause right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I think it feels a lot faster, but that's, you know, that's a good solid system right now. I agree. I agree. Uh, mm. so yeah, that's it. That's, uh, all of our Twitter questions for this week. Uh, we will be, if you want to follow uh, me, I am at Ryan Shrout. Patrick is at Patrick Norton. We are very uh, creative when it comes to choosing these types of things. If you follow <laughs> both of us, we will let you know, uh, usually on Thursday in the kind of early afternoon time frame when we're fielding questions for the show so you can get yours answered by us. Mm -hmm. uh, that is going to wrap up the episode. I want to thank everybody who was watching live. Uh, if you want to catch us live, you can do that Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific at live.twit.tv. Uh, you can find me, uh, the writings I do, videos we do, uh, another podcast we run at PC Perspective, which is at pcper.com. And Patrick, I know we can find you at techzilla.com and hdnation.tv, anywhere else, Absolutely. anything new that I haven't, haven't heard of yet? Uh, nothing too major. I am uh, finally relaunching my long fabled website, but I'll wait until it's, Ooh. it's really on its feet and not sort of, you know, hobbling around after falling, uh, you know, I'm going for a cult being Lord metaphor. That's going to make everyone uncomfortable. Yeah. Okay. Techzilla.com, right. hdnation.tv. Last <laughs> <laughs> uh, week. And remember, we're going to talk about something that has to do with $200 in graphics cards. So make sure you tune in.